agreement. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Andrew Ackerman with Dream It Urban Tech. This is Michael Beckerman, my guest for today. Uh, since you're here on time, that means you get to see us burn three minutes while we wait for all your latecomer friends to join us. But we'll try to talk about something vaguely interesting and maybe mildly scandalous to keep you entertained. Very scandalous, three minutes. I would hope. Very scandalous, great. Anyway, all the key stuff. Uh, but please, while you're here, since you are here early, uh, we will take questions during the presentation. Just put it in whatever comments section, whatever site you're on has. They'll put it up on the screen over there, and I will try to get to them either during the presentation or towards the end. So please do ask questions. Uh, for those of you who are joining us, this is Dream It Live with Michael Beckerman. Michael, uh, while we're waiting, let's give the uh, early comers something that no one else is going to get. Oh, what? And you can no use names. Though. You can use names or not, <laughs> right? But what was one of your oh my god that just didn't happen moment in the you know the seven or eight years you've been running CRE Tech? Uh, actually, it happened yesterday. Awesome, cool. I missed that. It's new to me too. I mean, like honestly, like every day there's honestly something happens where I'm like, wow, that's pretty freaking amazing. So there was one yesterday, somebody that I have just great respect and admiration for in the larger tech sector. That means had, we're not going to get a name. Had, okay. had reached out to me and said that they're coming into our sector and this is somebody that uh, will sort of uh, send shockwaves in our little industry mm -hmm. when people know that this individual is coming into our industry. So I think it was uh, it's great validation. Cool. When you say he's coming in, you mean he's not part of the real estate world and coming into the real yes. estate world? Interesting. Yes. From the now big, you're killing me. larger tech community. I'll I was th I was thinking something. Good. Okay, no worries. I won't say anything okay. about it. Pretty good though, huh? Could be worse. <laughs> Could be worse. Not worried. It'll be fun to have him in. Okay, once again, for everyone who's just joining us, uh, this is Michael Beckerman from CRE Tech. We're going to get started in about a minute, minute and a half. Uh, we just find that it takes about two, three minutes for people to, to cycle in. Just a reminder, we will take questions. So please, whether you're on uh, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Dream, uh, LinkedIn, whatever platform you're on listening to us, please Put any questions you have in the comments field, and we will do our best to get to them before we let Michael go. How about this, though? How about I, I ask you the same question you just asked me? Oh. Aha moment <laughs> over the last number of years you've been doing this. So I'll, I'll go for the scandalous. I was at a very large conference uh, not too long ago, and it's one of those conferences where you go out late at night and oh, drink, geez, there we and go. drink and drink. Okay. And, I'm uh, out, everybody. No, it wasn't one of yours. It wasn't one of yours. Oh, Though, I, you know, you have to step your game up. I do. Uh, and at one of them, uh, one of my friends who shall remain nameless had a friend of his or hers, not giving anything away, uh, come join. And that person got really drunk. And my friend ended up setting her up with somebody else there. I'm like, that's nice. I know I'm at the right event. So if my kids wind up watching this, what my friend oh, Andrew it doesn't happen about at CRE Tech. is that people were friendly with each other <laughs> and they had a good time. They probably had a nice lunch. Uh, okay. Cool. Now we are officially live. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Andrew Ackman. I run Dream It's Urban Tech channel. Uh, this is Michael Beckerman. Michael's going to introduce himself in a moment, but suffice it to say, he has been in this field a long time. He has seen, I would say, virtually it all, mm -hmm. and is going to tell us about some of it today. Michael, why don't you take a minute or two and tell us about uh, how you got started and what you're doing now. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here and all that you, Andrew, and the team do in our young industry and dream it um, as well, of course, you've had a profound impact on our space. So we're, we're very grateful uh, for all that you, that you and the team do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just somebody that um, uh, thinks of myself as, a, as an infinite learner, that somebody that's just always looking for the blank canvas and um, just every day, just trying to push myself into areas I've never been before. So I've been doing that for about 30, 35 years, always in this one industry though, commercial real estate. Uh, started out, uh, built a uh, public relations firm in my early 20s, uh, didn't go to college and just, you know, been trying to figure out uh, how to make a living and make an impact and enjoy what I do every day since. And about uh, seven, eight years ago, decided to go leave that world and go into the tech sector of commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing that ever since with Cretech or Crete, CRE Both. Tech. Sorry, 
We have this, this ongoing uh, little dispute. Michael's trying to push the term Cree Tech, and yes. I am steadfastly refusing the to go cool along with that. The cool kids like to say Cree Tech. Not it's not happen. my choice. Okay, so uh, basically you've been talking for a living for 30 years, yes. and for the past seven years, <laughs> I've, been, I've been doing conferences where <laughs> lots of people talk to each other. Great, let's jump right in. Um, what kind of people come to Cree Tech? See, I did that. That's, that's the one great. time. That's a great question. Uh, that's why I never like to know what people are going to ask. Uh, what kind of people come to Cretech? Well, so let's say when, when, when this whole thing started, and it was started by my dear friend, current uh, partner, Pierce Neinkin, say 2011 or 12. It was a, a volunteer organization. It was mm -hmm. people just committed to technology. He was at CBRE. Mm -hmm. Eventually went to go work at Airbnb. And then I had started in the space with our first site called the News Funnel, um, and then the Content Funnel, and now Atypical. And then we bought Cretech in uh, 2017. But, so, by the way, Content yeah. Funnel and the News Funnel, great sites. Thank too. you. Great Thank email. You. Uh, come out once or twice a week. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, well, great it's, wrap up. Great. Yeah. Why don't you tell them? Why don't I tell so them? So the News Funnel is like the largest news aggregator in the space. We've got about mm -hmm. 160,000 people getting customized real estate news on a daily basis. And then uh, Atypical is a great digital marketing agency for commercial mm -hmm. real estate. I, I use them as my crib notes for the Thank day. If I'm, running, if I'm running late, I know I can just look at the News can, Funnel yeah. and I, I've got That's the highlights. That's the whole point. We're trying to help you out. Makes me look so less dumb. Who, you know, so who was coming in 2017? I think it was mostly startups, mm -hmm. uh, venture. And fast forward to our last conference, which you were at in, uh, and supported us, thank you so much, uh, in Brooklyn uh, about a, a month or so ago. We had 2,000 people from 35 countries and, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of landlords, brokers, asset managers, institutions, mm -hmm. private equity, in addition to startups and venture. So the community is really Absolutely. expanding and growing. Or as we like to call them, customers, at least for startups. Customers, yeah. yeah. Uh, and by the way, that was a, a big improvement, not a big improvement, but a big jump. Last year, I think you topped out at 1,100, which I thought was Thank huge. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. By the way, funny story. Did I tell you about your venue last year? Uh, no. I'm sure so, there's a lot of funny no, stories no, no. about so our I, venue. No, I, no. I walk into that venue. And Terminal like, 5. Yeah, Terminal 5. I'm like, damn, I know this place. You I can't figure out why I know this place. And it's bothering. It's bothering me. I'm on stage for the panel, and I look around. There's these balconies. Yeah, it's, it's a all concert done venue. Around. I'm like... Oh man, I partied here in the '90s. <laughs> While I'm in front of the audience, it hits me. That's why I know the place. I'm picking up a theme. Yeah, yeah, good, um, good, good, was, good, good. It was a while ago. Good. So let's jump in. So now that we know who's there, we know roughly, uh, um, we know roughly the kinds of people. And 2000s, one of the bigger events in the space. Um, let's talk about the whole concept of partnering with startups. Uh, how you know the easy question is: Have you seen? You've already answered that. But you've seen the appetite in the landlord and the developer and the operator community to partner with startups, you've seen that grow over time. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you've seen it grow, the kind of things that they've been interested in, and uh, more to the point, like, how do they do it? What's their interest level? What's their level of sophistication? Tell me a little bit more, like, who they are so that the startups who are listening can kind of put themselves in their shoes and maybe understand who's on the other side of the table a little better. Yeah, so, I mean, a lot of a couple thoughts. Um, you know the the industry things are going great in the industry, right? Mm -hmm. uh, money's pouring in. When I got started, you know, fifty million or so invested in the space. A few dozen startups, mostly New York, two thousand twelve, thirteen. Mm -hmm. This year, twenty five billion. Uh, Seven thousand startups have gotten funding to got date. It. The good news is money's coming in. The, the class of entrepreneurs, particularly that are in Dream It and others, are, it, it's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. You had LD on last, last yep. episode, which I watched, which was terrific. And he's representative of, of I think, just the extraordinary talent that's in the space now. Mm -hmm. The challenge remains, uh, we, as we talk about, a lot about, is adoption, right? Uh, and why is that? It's because there's not a great infrastructure in place on the landlord or the broker or the, mm -hmm. or the asset manager side to adopt a lot of these technologies. So I think we're still, given all the momentum we're in the first inning, that innovation in commercial real estate is still a little bit of a foreign concept. So um, what are they looking for? I think they're looking to learn. I think they're looking to discover um, and you know, marry their particular needs with you know, what's out there and what's available. So I, I, I said it as a statement, but it probably should have been a question. Are you seeing more appetite uh, among the... The, the landlord and the developers and the, the operators 
to work with startups or is it just my imagination? What do you think? I, I mean, I think it's been growing quite a bit just by seeing who comes to the events and even who we meet. Like, I think it's been, it's an evolution. Like some people are still at the learning tourist phase and some people a little bit more about, you know, I might want to move here and live here. Yeah. Uh, but you've been doing it longer. So we, at our conferences, one of the, the ways that I kind of determine how much progress we're making is we have, a, we have this app that we use, which is a meeting app. And it's one of the most popular features at our events. And at, at the Brooklyn event, which we just had, there was 20,000 meetings set up oh, over wow. two days. 20,000. And then I look at, you know, who's meeting who, because it's my company, I could do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, and it helps you plan a better event. And it helps us plan better events. And, I, and the, 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 the amount of landlords uh, and developers, asset manager types, that are, that are meeting with startups is at an all-time high. So, so it's not just developer to developer, shopping deals around, it's actual developers to startups. Interesting. Meeting people, meeting startups. Very nice. At our conferences to discover what they're doing and how to apply it to their particular business. So um, I think like when I first got in it, office was the largest category of, yep. of uh, participants. And now I'm definitely seeing a lot more multifamily, which is Very coming nice. on strong. You were just at, uh, I know, Optech, which is a great event. Mm -hmm. uh, industrial's always been sort of strong. And retail's also picking up uh, some momentum there as well. But I would say office, multifamily, landlords. And, you know, what we first saw was it was the big ones. It was the Brookfields. It was the RXRs. It's the Tishmans. It's the Prologuses of mm -hmm. the world. Um, the May switches on the retail side. And, you know, so, you know, they had the resources to hire talent, and infrastructure, and now we're starting to see, you know, more of the mid-sized owners, developers coming in and inquiring and look and investigating. So the, the appetite tech. for innovation is actually starting to trickle down. I more absolutely and more. think so. Super, I see the same thing. Good, so good to hear that. Um, let's put ourselves in the the shoes of say a startup at your conference. A lot of potential people they can talk to here. What's the best way for them to get a sense of like these guys? They know what they're doing. They're serious. I want to prioritize them. These other guys, very nice, but it's going to take a longer time. They're still earlier on their journey. They still don't really know exactly what they want because it's all about maximizing the time and ultimately the money you spend on marketing in these events. So what would be some tips like, okay, you've met a potential customer. That one's really serious versus that one longer term. That's such a good question. Um, so, you know, I... I we don't have any particular one, you know, skin in the game in the sense that like I want this one to win or this one mm -hmm. to win uh, or this category. We want everybody to win and, and, and thrive in this industry. So when I, and I, I try and make myself available to as many startups as I possibly can to try and give them just some free advice mm -hmm. for whatever what it's worth. Having been in this industry for 30 something years, uh, commercial real estate. And I tell them like, go where the F, the, hmm? Go where the friggin' fish are, right? Yeah. Know where they're biting. Know who's biting and where they're biting, because you could look at commercial real estate and everybody comes in that comes in fresh. They go, "Oh, it's a, it's a, you know, seventeen trillion, billion dollar industry. Look at all this food. Look at all this opportunity." Mm -hmm. Wrong. You have to find out which ones are the early adopters. So, so how so, do we do that? How do we do that? First thing to do is look at what else they're adopting. Mm -hmm. So just. Do some basic homework to understand either through talking to other startups or going online and figuring out which companies are adopting what. Got Do it. a little homework. So if you see that XYZ developer is using that particular site, that, what does that tell you? They have the appetite and the infrastructure to adopt. Right. So I don't think it's rocket science. I think it's just doing a little bit of homework and not just under saying, oh, so-and-so developer is here. I want to get a meeting. Yeah, great. But your expectation needs to be... Awesome. Uh, you know, I want to keep going on. I also want to remember, remind people who are just joining us, uh, if you have questions, throw them in the comments field of whatever site you're on, and we'll try to get to them at the end. A lot of great questions. We got Michael Beckerman. I mean, he's been doing this for 30 years, so ask whatever you want. The other thing is, in case you, want, you, you saw him hesitate for a moment, we're on a lot of panels together, and there's usually a pool to see which one of us will drop an F-bomb first. <laughs> I almost no, I'm, I'm, won. I, I know. You I can, go ahead. You can do it. This is, this okay. is not a necessarily a family Don't want to be gratuitous in that so regard. So let's jump, let's go a little bit deeper. So we're at, you know, you've, you've, you've found an organization which you think is uh, one of the more innovative, more ready to adopt technology because you've done your homework. Uh, how do you find the right person in the organization? 
Are there certain titles that generally are good signs, maybe generally bad signs? And maybe it's different for you know, a Brookfield or a Blackstone than it is for uh, you know, 100 year family owned business that's you know, New York Metro or maybe Northeast region. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I would recommend, well, first of all, to, just to step back a second, sure. if you don't mind. So I think what a lot of startups misinterpret about this industry when they look at it and they say, it is the biggest industry mm -hmm. on earth as measured by global GDP, right? It is the least innovative, not True an that. insult, no disrespect. It's just fact. So surveys have been done, studies have been done by MIT and Harvard and many others. Most industries reinvest in innovation or technology 8%, uh, commercial real estate's under, under one, okay? It's just a fact, the way it is. Mm -hmm. And they, if you understand the DNA of commercial real estate, the one, the one word that I think defines most real estate companies uh, is, is risk, right? Or you, avoiding risk. Well, just risk. Yeah. Risk is the word you have to understand that. Mm. What is their tolerance for risk? How much are they willing to uh, try new things? Because in that world, if you, if you make a bad bet, you're fucked. I mean, you cannot, as in real estate in general. It's, it's 100 years. You have to live with it. You, you have to live with it. These are massive decisions with implication. And, then, and that, that has implication in terms of how they view technology. So you have to look at the risk tolerance of that particular company. And I think you can easily kind of look at it and say, uh, you know, this is a company that just by looking at their portfolio, looking at where mm -hmm. they go, looking, you know, are they a company that is comfortable with taking some risk yep. and investing in innovation? And I think you can figure that out. And what I tell companies, startups is just, you know, focus on a few targeted uh, prospects and work really hard to understand them and then work even harder to get them to adopt and onboard your technology. Don't just go out there and spray and pray. Um, so I don't know if that answers your well, question. No, I, I'm gonna build on that a little bit. Uh, when I was first getting into the space and trying to understand uh, where the appetite for risk was and wasn't, one of the first people I've spoken to was Guy Vardy at Silverstein mm -hmm. Properties. I actually knew him back when we were neither of us in the real estate space. Uh, and we were talking about the kind of technology he was comfortable with. <clears throat> and he said, Andrew, sorry, Guy's Israeli also. He's like, you have to understand, <clears throat> if it's something that has to do with the heart, the infrastructure of the building, like it's an elevator, I am least willing to risk that. There you go. The elevator stops working, yeah. you know, big problem. Yeah. Uh, if it's a sensor I put in there and then you got a business and it's just a sensor that's stranded on the wall, okay, I'll take it out eventually. And if it's a software layer that if it doesn't work, I just go back to how I'm doing that, I'm willing to try that more. So you can think about your startup, where the risk is, not only relative to that one company, but also the type of startup that you are. That was an interesting framework. Yeah, and then I think like in the marketing, again, these are, this is like in the first iteration of your going to market strategy is, then once you, understand, once you get those kind of cu the customers yep. and you can onboard them and work really hard to get them to be your best success mm -hmm. stories, then it's a FOMO. Then it's like going to market and saying, we're working with this company, this company, this company. And that way, that's the, that's the way the industry works is others then will notice that and they'll say, so-and-so is using this, so-and-so is using that. And then there you go. And then you could use more traditional marketing, digital marketing, social, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got to get... You know, you've got to land some customers and it's long and it's arduous and it's hard and you have to understand mm -hmm. what that company's risk tolerance is. So at first, you talk to a lot of people, figure out, you know, who is willing, what type of people and who are willing to take that risk with you. Uh, get those referenceable customers yeah. and then it's FOMO, FOMO, FOMO. Yeah, Rinse and repeat. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, you've been doing marketing PR for a long time in the space. Uh, I'm sure you have a couple of opinions on you know, what works and certainly what doesn't work. Uh, a lot of the startups have, we'll say, not unlimited funds and none of the startups have unlimited time. So what, um, let's start with the mistakes, it's always more fun. <laughs> uh, what, what are like, oh my God, they did that and it killed the company style mistakes or almost killed the company style mistakes in marketing your startup? Uh, I mean, I'm going to get my friends in the PR community pissed off at me, but I'm too old. Uh, and the rest to, of to, your company I, I, in PR. I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, 
You know, I think the first mistake is, again, we're talking about these young, let's say they're coming out of dreaming. You, you, you can also phrase it in the terms of, if you're a pre-seed looking for your yeah. first couple of customers, here's what works, doesn't work. If you're more mature, if you want to put it that way. So if you're pre-seed, if you're early, if you're a young uh, startup, and I see these, some of these companies talking about these massive marketing budgets for PR or marketing or promotions or things like that. And I say, you're just wasting your money, honestly. You're just mm -hmm. throwing it away. Because again, of what we were just talking about, you've got to be laser-like in your approach. So I would invest in things like, again, uh, whatever kind of technology, marketing tools, assets that'll enable you to do a great friggin' demo. That'll okay. enable you to showcase your product, sight unseen, material, you know. And those aren't expensive things, but it's just a great book, a great pitch book, a great deck, a great something. So much that you see them all the time, yep. they look like shit. And I'm going, this is your first impression that somebody mm -hmm. said, send me something. And why people just overlook the importance of that first impression. I hear you. You see that. So I have a high tolerance for work in progress. I have a high tolerance for like, you know, cruddy looking stuff. But the truth is a lot of the startups out there, <clears throat> they're investing in like magazine glossy style, and it's, it sucks for your startup to get overlooked just because you didn't put the, yeah. you know, the extra little bit into making it look as good as it is. And, 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 and communicate. Communi I see so much stuff where they just haven't taken the time. So this is the thing. It's not about money. It's just taking the time to understand the importance of your language, mm -hmm. your words, your value proposition. It's got to be immediate and instantaneous because, again, our industry is not looking, waking up every day going, all right, somebody said, who's looking at the new tech stuff today? Come on, I, can't, I need more, I need more, I need oh, more. They're not looking. You have to catch their you attention gotta catch when they're it. not paying attention. So that, that's, very, that's baby steps. That's the basic stuff of just great material, great web presence. Uh, I, think, I think social is important as well. Mm -hmm. I think having a good presence on social, but it which, does. Which, which ones in general? Like, I mean, Instagram or LinkedIn, Twitter or Facebook? <laughs> Do you have um, any, I know it's, you know, I your mean, mileage I'm a, may I'm vary, a, but. I'm a LinkedIn guy. Okay. Uh, I'm a tw I Twitter, LinkedIn mostly. I know Instagram on our, our particular ad, uh, platforms are helpful and important, but, um, you know, I think those two or three, it's definitely not a Facebook crowd. Yeah. Your so, mileage may vary. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, we're all, we're talking primarily now B2B enterprise sales startups. If you're going after direct to consumer, that's, that's not a different my world. world. That's exactly. not my world. And then I think it's just, it's just moving along the evolution of marketing cycle. I think, um, again, I'm not a guy that, that's a big believer in paid. Mm -hmm. So I think as much you know, good media uh, exposure is important. Getting to know the journalists in the trade. Uh, you, a lot of folks can do that themselves. Um, reading. I can't tell you, so at Cretec, you know, we don't, we're not journalists, nor do we aspire to be, right? We mm -hmm. aggregate every day, 10 stories. We send it out to our distribution list, 50,000 on that, growing every week organically. How many PR firms email me and say, Michael, would you like to interview the founder? No! <laughs> I get pitched for that. I write occasionally for Outlaw. Yes, I mean, yes. Yes, I would love to. But I'm not going to write about it because I don't do that. We don't have journalists. We're not editorial. You aggregate from so other sources. So just understand, you know, the nature of the beast. Yeah. Um, and then I think, again, you know, you go all the way down the food chain. You see what, like, VTS does or Honest Buildings or Reonomy. A lot of these companies are Procore are putting on their own conferences, their own customer uh, experiences and things like that. So I think... You know, it's just from starting out very basic, understanding the value proposition, mm -hmm. getting some great videos and testimonials of your customers, putting them online, sharing, socialing, socializing, commenting, coming to conferences, speaking at conferences, um, some good, smart PR, uh, all the way up the food chain. So I want to blow out a couple of those things, but I want to add one thing that, the, that you gloss past, but I think is critical. Most startups at the early stage don't know how to describe their own company. Uh, they really don't. Right. Not concisely, not in a way that hits the pain points that the potential buyer is. So in a, in a prior life of mine, my first startup dealt with the summer camp industry. Yeah, we're, back in the, we're back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and we were telling people, oh, you know, do you, do you have a website for your summer camp? And they're like, back then, a, a website was like a three-page brochure, right? They're like, oh, yeah, I got that. And they just kept walking past our booth. Again, not the most important thing on their mind. Took us a couple iterations and we realized at that point a photo gallery so they could see pictures of the kids, parents could see, mm -hmm. and pass were protected because the camp directors were afraid that there's going to be some like nasty guy doing nasty things to photos of, of kids. Uh, what we finally hit on is 
hey, does your website have a password protected photo gallery? Mm. And we would time it. They'd walk past our booth, they'd get about two thirds of the way past, we'd finish that sentence, they'd stop and turn around. Mm. Because that was a key point, pain point for them. They did not have a solution. It was something they hadn't seen before. Great. So if you can distill it down into Love the it. eight seconds it takes someone yeah. to pass your Elevator booth pitch. at Cretech, uh, to the point where they'll actually turn around and come back to you, like that's how you know you've got a concise description. So, right. So I think um, just a couple other thoughts. So the concise description has to reflect in our world ROI. That's what every landlord or every broker is looking for. Mm -hmm. If I give you my time and my money, <clears throat> What's the benefit to me immediate? I don't want to talk about like, you know, oh, you have to invest in technology and innovation because you need to. Mm -hmm. Why? Give them the value prop right away. On the website, you know, proven methods such as just getting some testimonials of your early customers, mm -hmm. putting logos. <laughs> Social <laughs> proof is big. Hugely important that people overlook. And, um, and then again, just if you're building your, your database, you're building your subscriber base and people are following you, follow up every week, send them something and don't tell them three things, three reasons why we're the greatest thing in the world. Teach them, educate, inform, uh, just basic stuff. That's what we need more of. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the other stuff. Again, early stage things, mm -hmm. stage that early stage co uh, founders can do. Uh, you know, care and feeding of journalists, right? Mm -hmm. Understanding from their perspective what they want to write about. Absolutely. And, and who's not a journalist. <laughs> uh, so I'm little basic research. Yeah, so do check the bylines whenever you see something. Yes. See what else they've written. Uh, uh, as a general rule, you tell me if, if you've seen this also, if they've just written about a topic, don't say, hey, you should include my company. Like, no, they've just written about that topic. That's dead. Come up with a new hook for them. Right, a new angle, something else that makes them want. But just saying, hey, you forgot my startup doesn't seem to work, in yeah. my experience. Well, if you just look at, if, 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 you know, you should be consuming every single day the content that's in our sector. There's probably 10 really important reads. We try and aggregate it for everybody for free and distribute it. So, but you should be reading about what, not only what's happening in the industry, what the key trends are, but like you said, what is that particular journalist writing about? Right, mm -hmm. and there's some just some best practices. Don't call up, a, don't email a journalist and say, "Why the fuck wasn't I included in something?" Like, yep. it's just like really. I mean, just just be thoughtful and say, "Hey, I read your article. Here's another twist or another theme or another angle or another thought." Something they can build a yeah, new article. Yeah, and they about. want ideas. I mean, most of the journalists that are in our space, they they're not they didn't come from the commercial real estate tech nope. sector because there wasn't one. So. You know, help them, educate them, give them some tidbits of some trends. Hey, we did a survey of our customers. Six out of sixty percent are looking to invest this much over this period of time, or value this more important than that. And that's a hope they can build an article. About. Yeah, feed them. Yeah. That's what you do. What about uh, you mentioned also talking at events, right? Yeah. Getting up on stage, being on a panel—that's great. That's free publicity. Gives you uh, street cred. Um, how do you do it? How do you get on stage? Not you or me, because like for how some do you reason, get on stage? yeah, like how as a uh, hustling startup, do you get to be invited on a panel or to moderate a panel or to give a talk just about whatever you do? So that's that's a, a thinly veiled infomercial. Right, good, good, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want that. So at Cretech, the dirty little secret in the event business, as you know, uh, you've not done mm -hmm. it, but is that a lot of what you see is pay to play, right? And meaning that it, you can get on stage if you pay, and uh, it's great. I mean, we, you know, everybody does some of it, I guess. Some people do all of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a knock; it's just different business model. My particular model is is more about I want great content. I want to put on stage people that are 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 taking the the themes and the ideas to another level. Mm -hmm. That's why you've been, you know on our stage yeah, so many I don't times. <laughs> so, I do actually. You're, you're one of the few that like, I do. So like what I didn't what do time. I want to see as somebody that picks the content? I just want to know what's interesting. Mm -hmm. My friend Karen um, Hollinger of, uh, of Avalon said to me, you know, I want to, I want to get on stage and I want to talk about uh, what's not being built for multifamily. And Great. I said, fantastic. Or, you know, Will O'Donnell talks about, you know, what Prologis is doing on the innovation front in, in uh, the logistics space. 
I mean, amazing, mind-boggling. But, you know, we've also had, you know, Owen Thomas, the CEO of Boston Properties, mm -hmm. and we've had Michael Rudin, and we've had a lot of people that aren't necessarily tech people, but are just very, very thoughtful about, you know, where the industry's going and how it has to evolve. Which and, is gold if you're a startup. You want to know. So I just want to see ideas. People can, they email okay. us all the time. So if you're doing, if you have an innovative startup in some topic in prop tech that maybe hasn't been covered that much, that's the kind of thing you can pitch to Michael. Like, hey, we're working on X. I haven't seen you talk about that yeah. at, at Cree Tech. Yeah. Happy to talk to you about it. Maybe, and maybe you propose to bring a panel together about it. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to get away from panels. Oh, that's right. You don't... Uh, well, we, we're, I'm always open to it. I mean, we're a work in progress. Or, or, or a, a side session, yeah. a keynote. We like, we like these keynote sessions, these sort of TED Talks, because I just think that they're more interesting and we can get through them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people's attention span is, you know, for... A lot Sorry, of what was that panels. About? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I'm always looking for new technology, new innovation, uh, new now, products. Would, would you, you know, budget ex permitting for other other um, other conferences? Is it worth paying to play, or it depends? <laughs> I think I think again, I, I don't come from this world, so I'm 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 just trying to put myself in the audience and say, I'm sitting in the audience. What do I want to hear? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's a good one. I, you, you got me. Uh, I think it just depends on who's in the audience. I mean, you want to know that your customer is in the audience. So if they're, if the customer is in the audience, someone that can write a check or adopt, you know, you look at different ways to uh, get in front of them. So in so, a weird sort of way, you want to put yourself in the organizer's shoes and say, if I were to put me on stage, would my audience be interested? And if the answer is yes, right. then maybe it's worth you paying. Otherwise, you're talking to people who don't care about what you have, so why bother paying for that seat? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, if I was a startup and I paid money to speak or, and I got up there and I saw that the audience was either not uh, my customer base or not sizable mm -hmm. in a meaningful way, I just think that that is just exposure for the sake of exposure. And that's what I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. Like, not, you know, it's not just a question in this industry of just getting as much as you can. Nope, uh, getting in front of the right people. Right people at the right time with the right message. And, you know, you be thoughtful about all this. How do you feel about content marketing? Well, I, I actually love it. I mean, one of the reasons why um, I decided to get out of the PR business personally was I just felt that, uh, no disrespect to my, my friends in the PR community because there's some amazing agencies out there that a lot of what was happening when I made my exit was that companies and people you could do through platforms your own mm -hmm. PR, your own messaging, and if you really were thoughtful about it, you could do a great job. And you didn't need me as a PR guy to do that for you. Th those days were go are long gone where you would have you know pitch in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and it would take you six months to work on a story and you had to cultivate yep. it, or you had crisis PR. Yeah, I just think that everything changed about 2008, 9, 10, 11 when I finally got out. Um, and then I really, really, really got passionate about content marketing. Um, and so we started to go into it and you know we built a whole platform mm -hmm. that my colleague, uh, partner Sarah Malcolm runs now which is just about content marketing, which is just writing great blogs, sharing it, commenting, uh, uh, video. I mean, there's so much, so much rich content out there. I mean, you guys do a great job. I was just talking to Charles about you know, the Dream It content. It's fantastic. I consume we'll it. Try. So you know, you're doing it yourselves. You're pushing it out frequently, consistently, and it's interesting. So I, my message is, you know, you, yes, work with an agency that does it. You could do a lot of it on your own, but it's got to be authentic and it's got to be in your voice and it just shouldn't be scripted for you as canned bullshit. I mean, that I, that, that I particularly can't stand. And it's why we built the News Funnel. It's my first platform was because I wanted to give people an, a, a, a tool that they could self-publish. That was my first yeah. duh moment was like, why, why, you know, why can't I just write something and then post it and know that people are going to read it? I mean, LinkedIn's great. Um, but that's what we're trying to do at the News Funnel, They're run by Jen McCabe. Cool. Why don't we uh, we'll cover, I want to switch focus just a little bit because some of the audience are those uh, mid-senior or senior executives at the, the companies that I, with respect, call customers. Yeah. Uh, and in many cases, they're trying to figure out how to get started. Uh, I have a couple of personas in mind. In many cases, it might be a larger organization where you're newly hired 
head of innovation. You could have been a newly minted corporate venture fund. And in some of the mid-sized family-owned businesses, it's often the son of the current CEO. Or the daughter. Or the daughter, that's true. That was, thank you. I guess I'm not as woke <laughs> as I thought I was. Uh, no, no, it's true. I mean, it's, it's true. Usually me Though in, in, in real estate, it's, it, the skew is a little bit uh, absurd. Wait till you get to construction tech. It, oh, no, it's like, I'm not there yet. It's mad, Soon. it's mad uh, skewed to guys. Uh, it, talking just with those two personas in mind, if they're listening and they're thinking, how do I find great startups? How do I know a great startup when I see them? What should I be doing within my organization to kind of prepare them for, hey, I'm bringing you this great startup. Um, I want to make sure it's something that you guys will pilot and adopt and love. Uh, Any tips for them? So I've spent a lot of time studying best practices in terms of tech adoption in other industries. Mm -hmm. That's where I sort of learn and I try and bring some of those lessons I learned to, to, to our young industry. And so it's a couple of things that I've seen that have worked well. So first thing is like sort of understanding what your organization's pain points are. Mm-hmm. What aren't we good at? Are we still at Excel spreadsheets? Are we, are we still using a fax machine? Are we like, where, where are we tripping up on inefficiencies? Where can we get better, right? So understand like what's the pain? Not so much the opportunities just yet, What's the pain? Because presumably that's where, when you bring it to the line, they'll be like, oh yeah, I want that now. And then when you bring it, so once you define your organization's pain, inefficiencies, then I think what you need to do is really take a good look at the company and say, well, who? You know, we don't, do we have an Andrew Ackerman on our team that, that is going to sit there and vet all these and then onboard, mm-hmm. you know? And, 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 and follow up and, 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 and maintain a level of, of, of engagement because that's what's needed too. It's not just something that you just, it's not just a shiny toy you just throw in, the, yep. in, the, uh, in an office. So understand the pain points and then just be realistic about adoption. And then I think you can go to market with those basic things asked and defined and, and really look at, okay, this is what's available. Who are they using? Mm-hmm. Who's got the best presentation? Who's doing the best follow through? Uh, who do I feel the best yep. chemistry with? Who's really in this? You know, who understands me and my company and my industry you the best? It. And I think I think you're you're in a good place to start. So you made a great point. I want to make sure it wasn't lost. You usually okay. do, but sometimes no, just joking. Uh, you made a great point. Like if you are the de facto innovation guy in your organization, maybe you have the title, maybe you don't. A lot of people. Don't, like if I'll tell, down in Tampa, we have a connection with the Tampa DOT. Our contact, his title is Director of Transportation and Stormwater Management. Mm. I say, Vic, how are you the smart city point, you know, point of contact? And he goes, Andrew, I have all the cameras. <laughs> right, so it's, it's not always a Director of Innovation or the, the Corporate no, Venture no, no, Fund. No, 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 it could be, uh, right. But if you are that guy, like understanding who within your organization is receptive to new technology, who's got projects that are willing to pilot. There may be this you know, older guy who's just waiting out his career. He will never give up Excel, right? Or Sharpies right. on paper. Uh, or there may be other people Sharpies. who are legitimately willing to adopt. But if you're a developer and you're project-based, and this is something for the preliminary citing, you know, what projects do we take? And you got nothing in the pipeline. The answer might be not to talk to that startup right away. Or it might be, I, this guy's got nothing, but maybe in the Southeast region, they've got something that's or, ready. Or my head of leasing is, is really gets this and is passionate about it, and I'm going to give him and her uh, VTS. Or uh, my head of investment sales is really somebody that's uh, very passionate about this, and we're going to you know, have her look at... Uh, you know, uh, 10x or by proxy mm-hmm. or Crexy or um, you know, uh, or my head of construction, and we're going to look at this. I mean, it's really just understanding your organization. And the calls that I get that make me crazy, that pull out what little hair I have left, are the ones that say, "Michael, I need to do something. Tell me what to do." You got to give me the more to go by. Well, not only that, like well, you got to look inside your organization and figure mm-hmm. out. What do you need to do and what can you do? Mm-hmm. By the way, that other point you made, also good, it's not a one-way trip. Right? No. It's not me finding stuff and I put it on a platter. Uh, knowing who within your organization is interested, 
they all have different needs. Yeah. Like, so you might look at a great smart apartment solution, but realize that it's your leasing guys that are willing to move faster. Right. So you just have to put the brakes on the exactly. smart apartment exactly. and go with the leasing solution or and vice I, versa. And I think like, we you know, again, we're talking, we're with the great dream organization. We're talking early stage, but, and we're, we're talking in our sectors, yep. first, second inning, whatever. Still so young. I mean, I think you fast forward down the road, in the not too distant future, innovation is just going to be like, you know, it's going to be like your Wi-Fi. It's going to be like air and water. I mean, it's going to be every real estate organization. Innovation will have to be core to their DNA. But we're not there yet. Uh, but they will have to be because there's external forces that are happening in the industry that will have significant impact in it. And I, that's why I don't talk too much about futuristic technologies mm -hmm. or what, you know, too far out there because we're not there yet. But if we spend a second on it, I mean, the, it too. the well, the customer, the fundamental change that's happened in commercial real estate over a couple of years, like, uh, you know, in the last two or three years is that the customer now mm -hmm. has extraordinary power. So that your customer is, is, is somebody who rents an apartment building or leases in a warehouse or is a tenant in an office building. Why? Because just the nature of the nature of work, nature of the generational changes and the, the, the view about how people live, work, shop, play, their expectation of what happens in these walls is forever different. First thing that it starts with is that they want flexibility. Mm -hmm. that, that's never going away, right? And they want, they want to do something within that space. They want engagement. They want choices. They want a sense of community. Um, I mean, don't get me started just on the whole generational millennial X or, you know, uh, changes in terms of the way they view work and, and living and what have you. So everything's going short term. Yep. So what can technology do for your organization to enable you to meet that new demand? Those are the most forward thinking organizations yep. that are adopting, you know, the HQOs and the Equiums and the, and the, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I think you got to get in the game. So, great point. Uh, I want to drill down on one thing that you said in passing. What's the right stage? Like, dream it, we deal with companies that are early but not super early. So, what that, let's, let's lay out some terms here, right? Pre seed, pre revenue companies, they've got an idea, they've got a product that works, perhaps still looking for the first couple of you know, referenceable clients. Then maybe you've got people who've got four or five referenceable clients some decent revenue, but still early on, maybe pre-Series A. And then you got companies that are more like the VTSs of the world that have raised tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, what advice would you give? We're still on the, the I, I am a customer, I'm in the customer set, I'm looking for innovation. How would you help them decide what stage should they be looking at? What's too early? What's maybe too late and not cutting edge enough? Mm. What's the sweet spot for those guys? Or I know it's different for each of them. How can they find their sweet spot? Right. Yeah, that's, that's a, damn. Why Probably should have warned you about why that Why did you one? send me these freaking questions in advance so I could be thoughtful about them instead of just ah, cause you wouldn't read pulling them anyway. stuff out of my, uh, I wouldn't. Um, pass is okay. I it's like good. No, no, it's good. I think uh, for me, if I was that landlord or that, you know, customer, as you keep saying, you're right. I would look less about stage and I would look more about the type of company, the type of entrepreneur. Like... I was with um, a couple uh, the other day, we were talking about it, and you know, I was asking, like, what's most important? And the answer was, it's really about the leadership of that, that, that you know, technology company, because they're not all s startups. Mm -hmm. And I think I would look less at the stage and I'd look at a couple things. Who, who are the founders and who's the leadership team? And how, how do I interact with them? Okay, so personal fit with the... Personal fit. Yep. Is this person responsive? I mean, basic stuff. Mm -hmm. do, are they, do, how's the follow-up? Did they take the time to understand my particular business? To understand that I am, I am a garden style multifamily owner as opposed to I am a luxury urban, uh, you know, class A oh, multifamily owner. I can tell you how much I hate when people reach out to me, cold email. I'd like to explore partnerships with XYZ. And I look, I'm like, how do you possibly think you're going to work with me? Yeah, exactly. Like, don't make me think about that. Don't you make me think me. about it. So the caliber of the team, the... Uh, the, the, you know, how much homework they've done. I think also, I mean, funding does matter because you do want to make sure that they're going to be around mm -hmm. because 
you're going to hit so many speed bumps. Every single startup I've ever met shows you the hockey stick. You see this more than me. And it doesn't happen. Yep. It just never happens, particularly in this young industry. It's going to take a long time. So what's your staying power? You know, show me your scars. Show me what you've done before uh, that, that I know that you're going to weather this and not go away. Because there's been a few failures and, and the companies, you know, they're gone. Yep. And then those that invested in it, not, not financially, but in terms of time and effort and onboarding are like, ah, you know, here we go. Got to start all over again. So, so they're, they're weary. Useful, you know, so that the customers don't end up working, depending on their level of, and level of appetite for risk. You, you want to make sure you're dealing with a company that will be around in two, three, five years, and funding is a reasonable proxy. I think for so. And that. who their who their funders are. I mean, like I do look at, you know, yeah. is it Dream It? Is it Fifth Wall? Is it Camber Creek? Is mm -hmm. it Navitas? Uh, is it you know John Helm's group? I mean, is it Met? I, I look and yeah. I say, yeah, yeah. So if those people back that particular entrepreneur, it does matter who you get your money from. Got it. It really, really makes a difference uh, in my particular and, eyes. And in case they don't know where to look for that information, where's a good site to figure out? You could just ask, but where would I mean, they? Crunchbase has a great, is a great one. Uh, you can see on their website a lot of times. Uh, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll you know put it on their website who their funders are. Um, and again, I think the other thing is like, Nobody's, nobody's product, where they start, is where they finish. So again, yep, do they have the product chops? Are they a product, are they a customer-focused organization? Because, I mean, you look at every successful uh, startup in, in Silicon Valley, I mean, none of them ever started where they wound up finishing. So, you know, those are things, some of the things to look for as opposed to maybe stage. Super. We have time for a couple of questions. I've got a few. That's why People I keep looking over there. Not that many. I know you lose focus after a while. I'm just a bored of myself. Yeah. So, quick reminder, uh, you can put your questions in on whatever platform you're consuming this on, and we'll try to get to those questions, too. We only have a few more minutes because, you know, Michael turns into a pumpkin in a couple of minutes, but let's get to the good ones. Um, Do we have any? Yeah, let's talk. Oh, we didn't talk about these yet. So, let's say you are a... Seed investor in tech startups. What advice would you give them, right? Um, mostly see venture capitalists, but they only want to see us when we get to seed. Oh, sorry, take it around. These, it's a startup saying how to get that seed investor. They, they talk to a lot of A round uh, VCs and they all kind of say, hey, you know, you're a little too early for us. Yeah, one of the things that drives me crazy about your business uh, is, no. is uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I get, and we've debated why it. Why don't you explain the soft no? No, you explain it because it's so your. The soft no I'll is sit back um, and listen to you so, now. So yeah, here's, here's what it sounds like if you're a if you're a startup. Hey, I really love what you're working on, but you're a little early for us. Why don't we keep talking and you guys come back heard and have this, a little right? more traction? So that can mean one of two things. It could mean hey, I really love what you're doing. You're a little bit early for us. Let's come back when you have more traction. Or it could be like, man, there's no fucking way we're investing in you. But on the off, off, off chance I've made a mistake and your round does come together and you actually have something, I don't want to be the moron that's left behind. So then please come back to me. But really, I think you're doomed. So, you know, there's, it's very difficult as a founder to know the difference between the two. Uh, what I tell our startups to do is you turn to the VC and very politely say, great, that's very valuable information what metric or metrics should I be shooting for and then I'll be in your, in very your strike good. zone. Very good. So if a, if a VC comes back and says, listen, we're looking for $1 million annual That's recurring correct. revenue uh, and I'd love to talk to you when you're getting close to it, they might be serious. Yeah. If they start hemming and hawing, like, well, it depends. They're trying to find like what possible cow flying over the moon would make them think that you're at all, <laughs> like, you know, even remotely on the right path. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you just can't. No, a lot of the time. Well, I mean, what, what I think uh, frustrates me at times is, uh, you know, ours is an industry that requires patient capital. We're mm. such a young industry. We're probably the last big industry on earth to, you know, catch this wave of uh, innovation and technologies. So we need patient capital. So let's just take the dream it's out of the equation. If I was getting into this game uh, and I was an angel and, and I was a startup, I would follow this playbook. I would make my customers my angel investors. So strategic money, you love my product, would you like to put 200 into the company? 50. 50, okay. 25. Whatever you can get so that they 
will sit with you, help you, teach you, and direct you. That's what they need. So it's more about the skin in the game than the actual cash in the bank I account. Mean, look, 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 at my, look at our mutual friend Nick Romito and Ryan and what, what they've done at BTS. I mean, they started mm -hmm. out, they were shooting videos, they got some uh, great traction from yep. their customers, and their customers were people in the industry, and they told them, hey man, that's good, that's cool. I'm paraphrasing Nick and Ryan. I'm, I know it wasn't that, like just like this, but you know, it's that analytics that you've got. Yep. And that, you know, is what we really want. And boom, you know, it wasn't so easy, I know. But like- It was an overnight success. Yeah, like but years. you know, I mean, that's what this whole industry, if you talk to Riggs, yep. if you talk to any of the founders that have, had, have made it through that early stage, that's what they'll tell you. So make your customers your investors. Awesome. I got another question here yeah. about trade shows, right? Of course, getting up on stage is great, but what about the booths? Are they, is it worth renting a booth at a trade show? Uh, <laughs> and they, they talk specifically about Optech Expo, the Cooperator, Buildings NY, et cetera. Cretec. Yeah. The Cretec booths are, of course, worth every penny and then some. Yeah, but here's the thing, right? Yeah. I think booths are very important. At our shows, we have three primary vehicles. We have our meeting zone, where people are just setting up meetings all day, every single day. We have our stage, where you want to come, you want to hear the CEO of the real estate company mm -hmm. give you some advice, tell you what they're working on, great. And then we have booths. Yep. So if you take a booth and you show up and you sit there and you go like this, what the fuck do you think is going to happen? Nothing, right? You got it. All the work in making a successful yep. experience is... Before you showed up, who have you marketed to? Who did you tell to? Who did you share on social media that says, hey, I'm going to be at Cretech Brooklyn, booth number you know, 77? Do, did you market it to your customers, to your mm -hmm. prospects? Did you, what are you doing in the booth? So Absolutely. it's not just a question. It's a great question about, you know, should I take it to a booth or not? It's how are you going to bring people there? Because they don't just, I mean, yeah. At our conferences, because we, we spend a lot of time trying to get the right audience there, people are doing great business, which is really important, but you've got to work harder than that. And you've got to ask about the audience. You've got to ask about the audience, right. Um, and a lot of these conferences have shitty conference apps. If they do have a good app, you should be working that for the week or two in advance. Yeah, and I also see some other conferences, again, not to just tout my own, because I don't want to be that guy. But, you know, I go to other conferences, like their trade shows, and you see the startup booth way out in the corner in left field, and it's like, you know, why did you, why did you spend the money on that? So ask Sorry. about the layout too. Ask about the great question. Ask about the layout. Where are they? And and what is the conference company doing to drive traffic? And who's their audience? Ask those tough questions. Ask about the schedule. Right? Are, you, are schedule. you competing with keynotes or is there a exactly. dedicated conference time? Very good. I'll tell you, when we used to do it, uh, my first startup, we had a rule. No one stands behind the table. Yeah. Whenever we went That's to a conference, advice. we were in front of the table. You should write a blog about that, by the way. You should yeah, write maybe. a blog, seriously, about like you know, tips and suggestions yet. about what to do to maximize a, a, your, your trade show experience. That'd be great. Let me think about that. Yeah, you should um, But yeah, we were always in front, right? If you're behind the table waiting for people to come to you, you were already making a mistake. We were out there, we'd pull people over. Again, you gotta have that eight second hook. But uh, we were always wandering around. In fact, a lot of the conferences we went to, it's like, guys, you have to stay in front of your own booth. You can't wander in front of other people's booths. But I'd rather get a brush back pitch than yeah, not get well, the pitches I want. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm, I'm a little... Uh, Yes. A little aggressive that way. In a good way. Um, last question. People ask it. It's you know, maybe a little out of left field, but why not? Okay, what, uh, what, what, what is WeWork? That's short for, what the, the short for the snafu that is now currently WeWork. What do you think that makes for the prop tech industry? Um, is it going to have any impact? I'm going to put my own spin on it. Is Please. it going to have any impact on perhaps you know, customers' willingness to pilot with other startups? What do you think? Um, I, I think it's mostly irrelevant, though I, I will give props to uh, Karen at Avalon Bay. She said when she's pitching ideas internally, like she's been trying to pitch, we got to do co-working mm. internally for so long. And the people who were not receptive within her organization were like, no, we don't want to do it, we want to do it. Now they're like, aha, we shouldn't do it because it's not sustainable, which is the wrong, in my opinion, uh, lesson to take. I think WeWork is a sustainable real estate model. It's just not a tech startup. Yeah. But it gave a little bit of ammunition for the people within a large organization who didn't want to experiment with that particular type of business. It gave, it gave them a little bit of ammunition to kind of resist it. But I think, generally speaking, um, for what my opinion's worth, it's, uh, worth a lot it's, to me. it's not going to make a lot of difference. If you're trying to sell a data aggregation services for real estate underwriters, like what happened with WeWork doesn't matter. If you're selling a 
construction tech solution for checking people in and off the site. Like what happened to WeWork is utterly irrelevant. Feel so, free to disagree. No, no, I, I, you bring up great points and I agree with most of them. Uh, uh, from my perspective, I think, forget the valuation, forget the company, forget the theatrics and, the, and, and all the drama around it. I've got a lot of great friends that we work that are working there. Um, and they've been very, very supportive of us. You know, what we work did was it, it really brought this concept of space as a service to the forefront. And it, they did not invent the category, but nope. they, I believe in my humble opinion, they really, really brought it to the next level. And that's why, you know, but there's, you know, there's, there's Industrious and Notel mm -hmm. and many, many, many others. But the, the, what I was talking about before about like this, this whole concept of commercial real estate as a hospitality yep. industry. They were largely responsible for a lot of that uh, traction that we've gotten over the last couple yep. of years. So as a tenant now, because of mm -hmm. WeWork, me, my company, we're a small company, we're 16 people, we want flexibility. I, I want cool space. I don't need the free beer. I'm a tequila guy only, so I, you know, you can keep the free beer. But I want, I want, I want, you know, technology on my phone that can program my office space. I want, I want all that, and yep. I want to, I want to be able to upsize and downsize. And, and I don't ever want to do a good guy guarantee ever again. So yeah, man. I mean, it's changed the nature of the game. So yeah, I mean, hats, hats off to WeWork. Yeah. In that sense, um, but I think. Where the company goes is far smarter people than I to yeah. determine that. But I but think I, it's also what gave birth, honestly, in the apartment sector. And I'm sure we were talking about it. You saw it at Optech was, um, you know, apartment hotels. Short talk to Karen about short term leases mm -hmm. now coming to multifamily. I mean, absolutely, it's a whole fully world. furnished turnkey solutions, Wi-Fi cleaning included. Like it's an interesting trend. And I don't think that's coming. I don't think that's going back. Yeah, uh, it's not going back in the bottle. Uh, no, which is the a good investors thing. make it, and that's what a lot of these technology providers are able now to help these real estate companies. You got it. So that that is a, that's a good thing, and you're cool. a good thing, and Dream it's a good thing, and thanks for listening. And so let's wrap are this up you really sick quick. Of me yet? Uh, no, never. But they might be. So yeah. let's let them, let's let them off the hook. Michael, if any of them want to reach out to you, Michael at Cretech.com. Cool. Um, great. That's easy enough. Obviously, you can reach me, Andrew Dreamit.com. A couple of reminders moving forward. Uh, number one. Uh, Dream It is a venture fund. We are always looking for great startups. And they're a great fund. I've worked with them uh, since you got into this oh, that's space. That's why we have them on. No, but really, I mean, Dream It, I'm going to give a plug. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, you, you talk about everything that I talked about, about accessibility, uh, responsiveness, uh, thoughtfulness, uh, investing Thank in you. people and companies. When you come to Dream It, this is why I love you guys, because it's the same thing. You treat people like I think startups should be treated, which is respect follow up and when you invest it's not just dollars it's like your time and your energy and your uh, your ideas and that's what startups need so I, I, I can't say enough good things about Andrew Charles the whole the whole team at, at dream it no, that's the only time during this this interview I haven't interrupted you <laughs> uh, hey please reach out to us you can email me directly or if you want you can go on dreamit.com slash apply uh, tell us about the startup we do run a pre-investment program all the information is on the website. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, in addition to urban tech, which is prop tech and construction tech, we also have verticals in health tech and secure tech. So please uh, spread the word. On that last topic, our next uh, Dream It what Live. Do what do you got? What do I got? We've got Ron Gula, well-known secure tech investor, is going to talk to you about trends in that space and what he's looking for. He writes checks too. That'll be on December 18 at noon, so tune in for that. Also, hey, we've been talking for an hour. If that's too much for you, I get it. I have a short attention span too. We also have things called Dream It Doses. Two, three, four minute, just straight up tips on very focused topics like how to do a market slide right or you know, big mistakes to avoid when pitching your startup. Uh, those are all on Dream It's YouTube channel. Go on YouTube, search for Dream It. I hope there aren't other people squatting there. It should be easy to find. And please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out if you have anything. It's been great. Thank you very much. Namaste. What he said, and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks, man. Oh, it was great. Thanks again. Really appreciate it. You're good. Did you, you get your plug in?